Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mark's Backyard Birds, a uh, program requested from YouTube followers that wanted me to talk about avian hybrids, you know, birds that um, are closely related, that uh, may cross over uh, species and mate and then produce an offspring, a hybrid offspring. What's that all about? How, did, how does that go about? Um, uh, you know, what are the requirements that they can actually do that? Uh, and some examples uh, that we see in nature. I really think this whole program was inspired by this news story that was all over the internet and in papers and things all over recently. And it was about uh, this new hybrid that they found in Texas, like San Antonio, I think is where this story came from. And it is a hybrid that they never documented before. And that is a green jay on the right, which is a, a Mexican species. It does occur in the lower Rio Grande Valley and has been working its way north um, in recent years. And a lot of people, uh, you know, scientists believe it has to do with climate change, conditions getting dry, drier, and they're pushing further north than they ever have. And now they have finally made contact where blue jays nest and, uh, and have nested for years. And they probably have expanded a little bit because of urbanization and some of those dry areas of Texas. But these two birds have come together and uh, had a pair that evidently mated and produced this unusual looking offspring, which is a, a, a a combination of the two features. And so that's what we're talking about is how does this come about? Why does this come about? Why would birds even do this? So first off, we're going to talk about uh, birds that you're more commonly you're familiar with. And then what are the birds most likely to hybridize and why is that? Well, uh, this is going to be an example we'll come back to in a little bit. But the one that probably most people are familiar with, most of us are, are ducks. Ducks are famous for hybridizing. Um, this is a picture of the classic white domestic ducks on the left that you see in your uh, the city ponds or local uh, parks and people feed them and popcorn and everything. Well, and then on the far right, there's a mallard. Um, this mallard it was wild at some point, in, you know, that its lineage, but has become domesticated. And if you know anything about mallards, uh, male mallards are absolute monsters when it comes to breeding with just about anything uh, and as many times as they can. They're driven by the propagation species They're to pass their genes along. And so we see a lot of these misfit looking uh, ducks uh, in, in places like this. And then they turn up and out in refuges and things too, which are the hybridization of a wild mallard uh, and a wild domestic duck. And they come out looking all kind of combinations of the brown. And um, they may have a tint of green to their head, a lot of white on them. So just a combination of features. And this, again, has to do with uh, these birds being pretty closely related. So you need to know that for birds to be able to hybridize, they really have to be in the same family of birds. So you would never have an eagle hybridize uh, uh, with a duck. Or you'd never have a hummingbird hybridized with a with a a, a falcon, and you know? so they have to be in the same family for the hybridization to even be possible. And so we do get some strange looking birds out there. And like I said, waterfowl. Uh, one of the reasons waterfowl is so famous for it is because of their nesting style. They got the you know, waterfowl tends to nest in huge concentrations up at the Arctic and on the edge of the Arctic. And there's many species in, in the, the wetlands that are available. So a lot of times their breeding is, is compressed into an area. And so cheating <laughs> is is uh, easier. And if you've heard me talk about do, you know about birds, do birds mate for life, or um, you know I've heard, you know, a lot of the the ideology of oh the, they they mate together for life and they won't mate with anybody else after they if one of the mates gets killed. And a lot of that is just not right. And I, I'll have a link to the video below about that uh, so you can read uh, or listen further on that. But I always talk about there being a lot of cheating in birds, and that is. When we, we do DNA testing on uh, like a, a nest of cardinals or a nest of bluebirds or a nest of any species, we've often found that uh, that several uh, parentages combinations make up the, the nest in there, uh, the, the egg, the number of eggs that are in there. And so there is a lot of cheating in nature. And that is all to do with 
to ensure that your genes are passed along because birds have hidden ovulation. So a bird, a, a, a male cardinal doesn't know if the female is, is fertile. The female doesn't know if the male is fertile. So to in, ensure that, the, you know, she's not wasting her time and she that some of her eggs will hatch and everything, they allow visitors at that. So in the duck world, that's very easy because you got this huge concentrations of ducks nesting in an area. So it's easy for even a, the, the upper left there is a northern shoveler uh, blue wing teal mix. And you can see that little crescent in the face, a little slight one of the blue wing teal, but the bill is a is a northern shoveler. And this is a, a hybrid. There's a site out there called Avian Hybrids on uh, the on Facebook. And you can look at many different examples of hybridizations that go on there. The one on the on the bottom left there is an interesting one. That is a snow goose great wider great greater white fronted goose uh, hybridization uh, that uh, Mary got a picture a few years ago. And then on the right is another one of those domestic mallards uh, that mix ups there. It, it, so ducks, it happens a lot with, and that's because of that close proximity of all those nesting together and their, their lineage is pretty close. So they're, they're able to produce hybrids whenever uh, they get some of that cheating going on. What are some of the other ones that we're familiar with and why does it happen? Well, Northern flickers, there's, you know, they, at one time they were called the red shafted flicker and the yellow shafted flicker. They were two different species. And this picture shows the yellow shafted at the top and the red shaft at the bottom. And how this happened was, is the yellow shafted flickers, the, the Eastern United States is where the yellow shafted flickers um, were divergent speciation, as we call it. And the red shafted flickers were in the Western US. And so the further and further they got in time, the reds were out there, the yellows were East. Well, what happened over time is in modern era, urbanization. We started settling the plains and we started settling the plains from the Rocky Mountains and settling plains uh, from the uh, from like Mississippi River and, and West and West. We got more trees, more uh, places where woodpeckers would do better, where instead of the Great Plains, where there were hardly any trees originally, now there's lots of trees. So yellow shafted's moved west, red shafted moved east, and there's an over the, the overlap zone where the two got back together. So all those years of being apart, and now all of a sudden these two uh, species that were very close anyways, got back together and there was a lot of hybridization. They call it an intergrade between red and, and uh, yellow. And this was in Rouchard a few years back. And you can see it still has the yellow undertail feathers and the yellow wing feathers, but look at this face. Its face has the red malar stripe, that is indicative of the red shafted flicker, whereas the yellow shafted has the black malar stripe. And the face is kind of mixed up in color um, uh, uh, instead of where the gray should be, the tan is there. And so this is an integrate. This means those, those two, uh, the male and the female of the two different color races got together and produced young. That's why they're considered northern flickers and not yellow and red shafted. But recent studies are showing that we're even in the overlap zone, that yellow shafteds are selecting for yellow shafteds to mate with and red shafteds are written and choosing red shafteds nests, which, which tells you they probably are uh, two different species, but it will take some time for be able that to pan back out again. Um, but it's interesting. It's like they got together and that curiosity thing, uh, but now, oh yeah, okay, now, yeah. It, it, that's a, the newness is over and now they're back, back mating. So it's it's pretty interesting story. So that is one of the reasons that uh, hybridization takes place. And this is a, a great example of how they can produce because they are closely related birds for sure. All right, let's go to another example. Oh, the chickadee complex. <laughs> uh, this is a, a very tough one. I got put I put the range maps in here for these. The top one is a Carolina chickadee, which is, of course, very much southern in nature. And that's the top map there. and shows you that they, they're they all over the south and then up, you know, it, 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 of course, they, they occur now up through Pennsylvania and into, uh, into New York and, and, and some of those states. And in Missouri, we have them. They are the chickadee across the southern two-thirds of Missouri. But at the, the map shows at the bottom of the black cap chickadee, uh, they shows that they're much more widespread. And like in Missouri, they occur, they're north of the Missouri River and north of northern half of, of uh, Missouri is where we have all black caps. Well, 
when Ruth and I do breeding bird surveys, we did them for years. We had one of our breeding bird routes was down in central Missouri, a little bit south central. And we had to run her out through there. And it is in what is called the overlap zone. The chickadees and, and black caps are both in that area. And there is a lot of cheating. There's a lot of uh, hybridization down there. And uh, the official rules that we had to go by whenever we were uh, counting those birds, if we just saw one of those chickadees, we had to we had to count it as a chickadee spa. If we heard it sing and a sink song, we heard it say heard the uh, the uh, the black cap chickadee or the uh, of the, the the Carolina, then we could count them as that. But they they're so closely related and the hybrids look very similar. It's hard to distinguish them. So if you live in an area where these are uh, borderline, they, they, they get together, then it can be tricky identifying them. And remember, a black, a young black cap chickadee every once in a while will do the. So it can be deceiving. But the, if you notice, the black cap has a lot more white in the wing than the, the Carolina does, and. For the most part, the bib is really well defined on a Carolina, where it's kind of messy on the uh, on the black cap. There's there's certain things you can you see them, but your safest thing is to use your range and where you are. Uh, but it can be tricky. Again, these are two very closely related species that when they get together like that, they can produce hybrids. Now, uh, what's interesting in the DNA work? Why aren't they just one species like the flickers? When DNA work coming about and we're able to do a lot of analysis on these birds' DNA, we find that actually the mountain chickadee of the West is more closely related genetically to the black cap chickadee than the Carolina chickadee is. So it, it, it's complex. Gen I mean, genetics is a fascinating subject and can be very confusing. But this is an example of cl close range overlap, similar species that can produce hybrids for sure. Now where uh, hybridization gets really, really dangerous for birds is in this complex. The uh, upper left is a golden wing warbler, one of the most beautiful warblers I think in North America. And the, right below it is the closely related blue winged warbler. And yes, they, they don't look much, a lot alike. Um, they do sound quite a bit alike. Their songs are very similar. And whenever they hybridize in the overlap zones, they produce uh, very distinct uh, hybrids. And the one on the bottom right, that's, that's known as a Brewster's warbler. It is just a hybrid. It's not its own standalone warbler. It looks it, but genetically it is a hybrid of those two birds. Now, why I say this is so dangerous is because what's happening now is the blue wing warblers are more aggressive. And whenever they get together, they tend to dominate the gene pool. And what's happening is the golden wing warbler is uh, literally getting bred out of existence. It is uh, it's getting... As I understand it from studies now, uh, there are very few, probably pure golden wing warblers left. Um, they, a lot of them have at least some blue wing warbler DNA in them. And over time, left unchecked, uh, we, uh, management techniques and everything are being uh, put into place. And there's plans uh, by uh, uh, conservation groups and Cornell Lab of Ornithology is one of them. Um, they have a goal to restore a lot more of the golden wing population if they, in the next 50 years or so. So, they, so this is an example of two closely related species that can you can actually lose a species just from interbreeding uh, and hybridization. So it is a fascinating topic. It, uh, the, I mean, genetics is, is crazy and there are several examples out there, but these are one I tried to hit on ones that you might be familiar with, or maybe you've seen in the news uh, that uh, and help explain a little bit what happens. I mean, birds that are, have, were, divergent in uh, evolution uh, that get and come back together uh, by environmental factors or whatever it is, and then they can breed uh, and produce hybrids. And then, of course, you know, the ones that are just so closely related, ones that nest in uh, close proximity to one over, like in large groups, like in waterfowl, all that can lead to hybrids in nature. But believe me, they're rare. I, I don't want to put this out there like it's super common because a hybrid between two species is much, much more rare than, you know, general offspring from them. But it, it just tried to give you a little insight as to how that's working. I don't want to get too complex. So that's a great idea for a program. Thanks so much for sending that in. And please send an idea for more programs because I want to, to talk about what you want me to talk about.
out. Uh, if you like the program, please give us a like, give us a share. If you're on YouTube, you hadn't hit subscribe yet, please do. And don't forget to ring that bell to turn on notifications because that's the way that you'll get notifications when I'm on next. So until next time, let's talk birds. <laughs>